Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the September 11, the 9-11 edition of uh, the Prajna Agenda Talks. Uh, this is the 20th anniversary of 9-11, a date that for those of us that do security and international relations, uh, watershed, whichever way we look at it, whichever perspective we adopt. And um, when I realized that the PGT for September fell on this date, there was only one speaker I could think of. And so here she is, um, Rita Manchanda, whom I met a month after 9-11 in Boston at the Women Waging Peace Conference, mm -hmm. where she said she made one of her flawless, you would never think she hadn't written it out and edited it and by hearted it presentations. And I'm not saying this to flatter her, this is the truth about Rita. And I have now had 20 years to have this confirmed empirically several times. Um, she said, and I remember, she talked about peace talks and she won't remember this, but she said, please don't rush us. Give us time to work things out. Be patient. You know, peace takes time. I remember this, or words to that effect, but I remember this so clearly. Um, it was so different from the things that I'd been reading about, you know, getting in there, in fill it, shut it, forget it mode, you know, just getting the peace talks done. And it made a great impression on me then as have many things that she has written and spoken in the years that I have known her since. We've been privileged to be co-founders of the Women's Regional Network as well. So I get to work with her a lot. So now this is, now I'm going to read you the official bio. Um, Rita Manchanda is a feminist scholar, author, and human rights and peace advocate working in South Asia with particular attention to defending the rights of the vulnerable and marginalized groups, women, religious and ethnic minorities, and forcibly displaced persons. Her particular expertise lies in exploring the intersection of gender with peace and security issues as articulated in publications such as Women, War and Peace in South Asia, um, which is actually a book that um, this is one of the first, very first books in this area, in this region, a path breaking, pioneering work, Women in Polit and the Politics of Peace, published a few years ago, and a recent chapter, Difficult Encounters with the WPS Agenda in South Asia, published last year. Her field based interaction with multiple stakeholders in the conflict peace continuum is reflected in SAGE Human Rights um, of Peace Audits in South Asia, volume five, which was published in 2015. We are genuinely very lucky to be listening to her today. And um, I'm so glad to see all of you in this room to listen. So I will hand this over to Rita and look forward to what she has to say. I really am so happy to have you. Well, I'm delighted to be here and thank you so much for that those opening remarks. 9-11, um, and in a sense, I'm also uh, very happy that I'm the person who is actually going to problematize security at this moment of remembering. A very, very difficult time, but a time that triggered um, a new world order, as it were, uh, focused on this abstract notion of a war on terror and the creation or the construction of ideological global master narratives like which focused on Islamophobia. The fact that, of course, in our region, South Asia, we have not only uh, Islamist mobilization, that is Islamist politics. We also have Hindutva politics. We have Buddhist nationalism. And I think if one travels to the Northeast, you will even find Christian nationalism. Um, but that apart, the question I would like you to ask yourself is, do you think at this stage, 2021, that's 10 years, more than 10 years, sorry, that's 20 years, would you say that we can feel more secure or less secure? You and I, women living in India, living in say even the US, 
living in Afghanistan, living in Pakistan, are we today more secure than we were 20 years ago? Um, some of you may have come across this uh, Thomson Reuter poll. I know that uh, Swarna has major uh, issues with uh, the, this kind of a gender poll, but um, let me nonetheless pull it out. And it's to do with India being recognized or ranked as the place where women are most at risk as well of sexual violence and of slave labor or forced uh, labor. Um, now, despite the fact that it may be flawed, I think we have to only look around us to know that it can easily be substantiated by the daily reports that we get of violence against girls, violence against women, violence which is both direct and violence which is both structural and gendered oppression that in particularly at the intersectional of marginalized communities becomes far, far more severe. In fact, if you look at the crowd of the poor, and here I'm looking at poverty as multidimensional, not only in terms of economics, but health, education, and so forth. Who crowds it? It's girls, it's women. Is there a connection between, say, domestic violence, physical violence against women in the home, in the family, and violence say in the back street or violence in public sphere or in fact in interstate war what is the relationship is there one and here i want to actually draw your attention to um, a concept that has influenced a great deal of feminist scholarship and that in fact has emerged through the work of both cynthia enlow as well as here i quote cynthia coburn and it's called the continuum of violence. And if I may quote, gender links violence at different points on a scale, reaching from the personal to the international, from the home to the back street, to the maneuvers of the tank column and the sortie of the stealth bomber, battering and marital rape, confinement, dowry burnings, honor killing, genital mutilation in peacetime, military rape, sequestration, prostitutions, and sexualized torture in war are all linked. Now, we've not actually been able to establish in scholarship the causal link between, say, domestic violence and interstate violence, but there is a great deal of literature, there's a great deal of research to suggest that there is a linkage, that, that security cannot that you know you cannot actually separate security gender inequality which is responsible for or in which violence against women is really rooted rooted in gender equal in inequality also translates so much into the violence of war as i hope to unpack so whose security is served by these state narratives. And what do I mean by these state narratives that define national security threats? Um, there's a lot of literature today to suggest that the crucial element in driving violence, in inciting violence, in creating the conditions for violence, particularly internal violence, has to do with the state narrative of security and the state construction, the social construction of suspect communities. Now, arguably, these state-driven narratives have to do with, in a sense, ensuring state stability, as well as, I would argue, more proximately, regime maintenance. Um, I understand there is someone from Sri Lanka. If I look at the aftermath of the Easter bombings in 2019 in Sri Lanka and the way there was this hyper jingoistic rhetoric constructing a suspect community and that is the entire Muslim community of Sri Lanka, you can see the immediate link to regime stability. Um, the regime was tottering post the um, hype or this post this hyper jingoistic rhetoric suddenly it gained huge 
impetus and much greater consolidation and stability. So one, state stability, two, regime stability in, in a context of elites jostling for power. But how does it get translated into how you and I get affected? It gets translated in terms of religious orthodoxy. And here, this is religious fundamentalism of all kinds, Buddhist, uh, Hindu, um, Islamic, Christian, he gets interpreted or gets conflated with being seen as extremist politics, militant extremism. Peaceful democratic protest gets conflated as um, violent politics, um, anti-national politics, and of course, ethno-nationalist struggles, and some of these are peaceful, some of these are armed, get conflated or collapsed into terrorism. Now, what does this mean? At, at a particular level, it means that you, that in Kashmir, you get a directive from the information ministry that you are not allowed to use the word militant anymore. You have to use the word terrorist in all your media copy. Um, now, we've seen more approximately, we've seen the, the way in which anti-security, anti-national um, sedition laws have been used, uh, widespread deployment, widespread, I would say, abuse of the use of these kind of laws to, in fact, arrest, to um, harass a great many, uh, to, in fact, crush dissent. Um, the um, this so in a sense the prevailing now there's also the you know uh, and this is global it's not something specific to India the crackdown on dissent and the use of authoritarian laws to crack down in dissent is actually global um, there's also a parallel trend and which is the hyper securitization or in a sense to use Foucault hyper saturation of the security discourse in the framing of issues. So you get the securitization of refugees, you get the securitization of um, migration, you get the securitization of public health, of the COVID crisis. Now, let me just unpack this because you're, you are very familiar with this. It means the, by securitizing it, you are actually uh, legitimizing the imposition or the rollout of a great many authoritarian regulations and policies. You don't even ask about them. It becomes something that's a given because it's all securitized. Um, and then you have, uh, and, and you know what happened during the lockdown, the, um, the assault, the brutal assault, the cannon, the water cannoning of the migrants, the punitive measures against people who transgress uh, quarantines, uh, the repurposing of a lot of uh, anti-national laws to actually, um, uh, um, uh, well, arrest or harass healthcare workers, journalists. I mean, 55 journalists were arrested just in the three months of the um, post-lockdown period, that is till August 2020, 55 journalists had been arrested. There was these huge uh, gag orders, there was uh, constraints on freedom of expression. Now, what enabled all this? What enabled this is the securitization of the public health discourse. Now, of course, I agree with you. By making it a securitized priority, obviously you gained attention, it became on a war footing, and that's important. But alongside came all this baggage. Whether a lot of this baggage will ever be rolled back, mm -hmm. these new laws, this new authoritarian regulations, that is a different question. Now, traditionally, the dominant paradigm of security, and I really do want to step back rather than um, <laughs> uh, go forward with, I cannot do that without um, just specifying what are we talking about when we're talking about security. The dominant paradigm of security has been uh, focused on state security and has been a paradigm, uh, a realist paradigm driven by um, the struggle of competition for power. 
in a world which has been anarchic and the anarchy has in a sense been kept at bay by, as you all know, the balance of power between states and war conflict happens when there is a breakdown of the balance of power. Um, women in this national secure uh, in this national security paradigm in this realist paradigm have actually very little space if any at all um, they enter in the sort of as a chorus raped women grieving mothers and so forth um, now this uh, paradigm was probably sufficient um, in terms of the world war one or at least considered sufficient in World War I, World War II, these were largely interstate wars. But as you get far more emphasis on, or the emergence of a much greater focus on internal wars of the state in conflict with its minorities or of groups within states in conflict with each other, um, there was the search for a different kind of paradigm that would be more responsive, more resonant with this, um, with this new reality, these new wars. And uh, this is a period when you, we are talking about the late 80, uh, the 80s and the 90s. Now you remember the Balkan wars were taking place uh, at this period. Um, we saw, and of course the global south, in particular Africa, Asia, um, in conflict, internal conflicts. Now it saw uh, the emergence of what is often called the liberal democratic security discourse focused, shifting the focus away from states to people-centric security. And you have the, um, its consolidation in uh, the UN, um, uh, UNDP report, Mahbub al Haq's report on human security in 1994. It really pushed the template. It widened the concept of security to include um, not only national security, that is state security and regime security, but also environmental security, food security, livelihood security. In fact, it became an umbrella term that in the end became quite really unmanageable. But it's important to recognize that its emergence was it, that it marched along other discourses that were also emerging at this period. You had the human rights, the World Human Rights Conference in 1993. You had the World Conference Against Racism um, quite a few years later. But you also had activism on the part of women. You, in fact, many women, uh, many women activists uh, and feminist scholars would suggest that the contribution of women, women in shaping the human security discourse in pushing for it, actually that they had a very, very important role to play. And here I wish to quote a friend of um, Swarna's, Betty Riordan, um, and she says, women's peace groups were among the first to argue that real human security lies in the expectation of well-being that is founded in protection against harm of all kinds, of the meeting of basic needs, of the experience of human dignity and the fulfillment of human rights and a healthy national, a natural environment capable of sustaining life. So in, in a sense, it is a very broad based, um, but strongly human rights based perspective. Uh, I would not say that it was necessarily taken on by the, um, by the uh, exponents and, uh, of human sec uh, security. For you find women feminists or rather feminists um, arguing that missing in the human security discourse is gender, is gendered violence and the crucial uh, I mean, Susan McCain, I refer you to her work, any of you who are interested, that there is a gender cap in the security discourse and that women's experience and gender discrimination is not taken into account in the way the human security discourse began to be articulated. That gender related violence and gendered inequality was is central 
to security and particular to women's security and it was missing this there was the gendered gap now um i think it's important to emphasize this is a moment where you're also having a uh, conflict in the balkans and i think uh, many of us are aware that a lot of the feminist scholarship that emerged on women in conflict uh, of gendered perspectives on conflict actually crystallized around analysis, analysis by, by the affected women themselves um, of, in fact, gender in conflict. You've had uh, 1995, you had a major breakthrough with the um, the um, Beijing uh, World Conference on Women and the Beijing Platform for Action on Women. One chapter was devoted to the impact of armed conflict. This was a major breakthrough because you've actually always had conflict off the radar. Somehow national security issues, these kind of things, women are very uncomfortable. Mainstream women at least are very uncomfortable with uh, dealing with, uh, they would prefer not to, uh, frankly, engage with some of these issues, but it became, but it, sorry, but it became a uh, very, um, I mean, it became, in fact, it became, came to the forefront because of the involvement of European women in the Balkan conflict. Um, and so you get, uh, the reason that this period is so important is because 2000, you get a um, historic groundbreaking resolution and this is the women peace and security resolution um un security council resolution 1325 and this is the security council that for the first time is recognizing that women are relevant to human uh, to international security the big boys club is recognizing it um and now but how did you get this and i think the trajectory of getting there is important to just maybe very, very briefly um, map. Um, of course, you've had women's activism, you've had grassroots activism, you've had uh, NGO activism, which is also burgeoning at this point of time, but you've had the intervention of some very, very powerful Northern NGOs, feminist majority, um, women waging peace, uh, you have, um, and of course, WILF, the most important, the, the most historic and the most important, which is Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. I think it dates from 1911 um, and uh, has been committed, has a dedicate, dedicated to anti-war politics, uh, peace politics. Um, they were a, a major driving force, but Unfortunately, in the history of many of these resolutions, of many of these historic world conferences and so forth, somehow the role of the global south, in fact, I would say even the role of the, of the second world, if you go back, you know, um, the second world being the socialist world, somehow is written out of history. It's only now when a lot of European literature is being translated that we're actually able to recover and excavate some of the, the contribution of, in fact, say the socialist women to the shaping of the women's agenda uh, or um, the shaping of the, or the co-production as I call it, of even the women peace and security agenda by women in the global South. Yes. Uh, and in uh, a very, uh, uh, Cynthia Coburn in her mapping of the history of 1325 will recognize that the Windhoek Declaration, that is the uh, South African Namibian Women's Declaration in the process. But somehow it really remains off the radar. What we forget, and I hear, I would really urge you, if any of you are interested, there is a chapter called Her Story, in women and peace politics by three or uh, four women who were um, present, who were active and who claim ownership of the co-production of, or rather the attempt to co-produce the women, peace and security discourse. This is Rashmi Goswami, 
uh, Kumudini Samuel, Hamida Hussain, Bangladesh, Kumudini Sri Lankan, uh, Roshmi is Indian, and uh, um, what I'm Pakistan, sorry, Nigat Said Khan. These women were very, very active, instrumental. Uh, they worked with what are called the femocrats, which are the, U uh, the, wim uh, the women in the UN system who are uh, feminists. They worked with them to, in fact, shape this. The fact that, unfortunately, a lot of the things that they had hoped for did not happen is, I think it shows the relative power and of the uh, Global North NGOs and the relative disadvantage of the Global South. After all, we're not located, our offices are not located in Geneva and New York. We cannot lobby the way that the others did. But, um, and here I, I would, I just want to very quickly flag that um, without at the moment going into unpacking the WPS, that is the Women, Peace and Security Resolution, what were some of the differences? What were, what is it that these women are saying that where they failed or where what they wanted didn't work? And primary was they didn't want it to be in the UN Security Council because they said, one, this is the big boys club. This is state centric. If, if the WPS resolution is actually civil society driven. It must be in a forum where the civil society can make an impact. If it's state centric, then clearly the focus shift, they lost out. And then not only that, what is the Security Council? The experience many of us have is that it is power, it is driven by the, by the imperialist powers and it's um, certainly not um, a, um, a comfortable place, let alone for women, but for people who are disempowered. Um, but nonetheless, it was in the Security Council and the women argued, the women in the North argued, and that there is a justification of that, that look, we will be noticed. These are the ones who decide. And therefore it's important that it be in the Security Council. We are so tired and it's true. You know, you always get corralled into UN women. You always get corralled into the women's ministry or at best social justice. Um, all the women, uh, most women politicians, Nirmala Sitaraman an exception, um, get squeezed into these ministries, the soft ministries, and I'm afraid they don't count. Uh, so they said, okay, you know, this is the power ministry, so great. But what did it mean? It meant that certain things were off the agenda. And the primary thing that got off the agenda was demilitarization. Women did not see militarization as increasing their security. And yet the one thing that was taken off the agenda was militarization and or rather demilitarization and arms control. I mean, how, you know, you have only to go to the Northeast, talk to the women in Manipur, talk to the women in Nagaland. What is it that they're saying? They're saying that we're awash with guns. The guns that my, and a Palestinian woman told me this once. She said the gun that my husband keeps under the pillow, which is meant for actually, public, uh, for reasons of public security or for perhaps reasons of even other kinds of violence is often turned against me. Women human rights defenders talk about the gun that was meant to protect them being used to attack them. So, I mean, you know, um, guns, the control of guns of small arms, demilitarization, these were core issue agendas, particularly of wealth, the women in um, peace and freedom, International League for Peace and Freedom. And yet these were off the agenda. Another thing that was off the agenda was the gender perspective on violence. You know, one of the major contributions of feminist scholarship has been the unpacking of violence and to bring in the role that gender, the multifaceted role that gender plays in legitimizing violence, in the construction, 
You see, after all, what is gender? Gender is not only women. It's the social role that men and women, or rather, the role that men and women are socialized to play. So in fact, the construction of violent masculinities, which is crucial for armies, for aggressive armies, the const requires the construction of also then passive femininities. And the, that you need this sort of unequal gendered power relationship is what actually enables wars. There is a brilliant book called uh, by Kathleen Barry called um, Unmaking War, Remaking Men. And this whole question of bringing in the gender perspective on violence, on the unpacking, the need to unpack violent masculinities, that was off the table. And the issues of social justice and um, socioeconomic and social justice concerns were also off the table. Structural reasons for conflict were off the table because, and you know, if you look at, um, and here I refer you to a, a, a very early book by Kumari Jayavardhane, Third World Women and Nationalism, a huge pioneer um, in the 1990s, and in which she talks about the importance of women's mobilization, of women's collectives being actually part of the larger and she says the strength of women's collectives is that they are part of these larger broad-based movements for social justice and for social, social economic, uh, socioeconomic equality agendas. All that is off the table. In fact, you know, the only resolution that you get is when I think Vietnam was the president of the UN Security Council and they got a resolution which talked about socioeconomic rights for women in the WPS group. There's a WPS group of resolutions that's off the table more generally. Then the flattening of the diversity of women. You know, we say women, peace and security. Um, Women in Kashmir have a very different understanding of security than you and I sitting, say, in Chennai, in Bangalore, in Delhi. Um, Muslim women have marginalized women have a very, very different attitude to security. If you're living on the border and you see a, a man, a uniformed soldier, you will react, uh, the, that woman will react differently. You cannot conflate the ex security experience of women in the North and the security experience of the women in the South, global South. You can't, you have to, you cannot essentialize, you have to contextualize. So they said, look, one size doesn't fit all. Um, and you had, of course, then the whole discourse of brown women, white women, and so forth. And finally, um, and this I, I need to credit Minakshi Gopinath, the, co the founder of WISCOM, um, the emphasis on what is called the dialectic of victimhood and security uh, and agency. You know, the one thing that is actually focused on in the women, peace and security discourse and the women, peace and security group of resolutions um, is protection, protection against sexual violence. What does that do though? You know, you've got a huge infrastructure now. We've got a special reporter, rapporteur against uh, violence against women in conflict, uh, sexual violence against women in conflict. You've got actually an apparatus which you don't have for anything else. But it also means you're emphasizing women's victimhood, not their resilience, not their agency, not their peace building, but their victimhood. And Meenakshi Gopinath emphasized what she called the dialectic of victimhood and agency, I would call it in a sense a continuum because the same woman who is actually a victim is also and has to be and is gets posi uh, positions herself as an agent as well. Um, so these were all off the table. Why were they off the table? Because it was being shaped within the Security Council and it was the global, it was the global North women who were actually driving the process. Although the initial impetus, the initial um, movement uh, and textual uh, work on the resolution was a co-production one in which the Global South women were equally involved and in particular South Asian women had a very large role to play. Now, um, 
you know, I, I'm just going to very, very quickly flag. Uh, so what are the pillars, what they call the pillars of what we have today in the Women, Peace and Security Resolution and the Women, Peace and Security Agenda and Discourse? Um, the three P's, as they're called, participation, and this is a big plus point, the participation of women in all processes of decision making in conflict. That is refugees, that is displacement, that is peacemaking, um, that is in conflict management, in reconstruction, so forth. Absolute plus point, but what has it got translated into is numbers, which means you can get proxy women. And, you know, I've been looking at Nepal, it has lovely quotas, 33%, but who are the women there? Are their voices heard? Are they able to access the networks of power? or are they actually marginalized? Afghan women, I think you got 27%, or you had 27% earlier uh, in the um, uh, representative, in representative politics. What did it mean? It meant that because of the levels of insecurity, the women who actually got in were connected with warlords, were proxies for them, or they spoke for their ethnic community. There were a few, and I can identify people like, um, uh, Faruqi. Anyway, uh, there were a few who were really still connected with the women's networks and they took their strength and inspiration from them, but there were very, very few. So in a sense, you know, participation got reduced to mere numbers, a, a numbers game, and eventually didn't translate. Um, but nonetheless, it's still an achievement. We're still pushing for women in peace processes, women in peace building, and so forth, and women around the table. Um, but um, then there is, of course, protection, and as I've said, the overemphasis on sexual violence. You know, unfortunately, the way and the major instrument for the implementation of uh, WPS is the National Action Plan. You know, a lot of countries have national action plans. In fact, most countries have national action plans, but even India does. But our national action plan, like the Canadian one, like the Australian one, starts at our borders, out, looking outside. We have no conflicts within our countries. So what are we going to look at? And I'm afraid the Canadians used to say the same. Right now, I think there's some enlightenment. The US says the same, the British say the same. It's we're looking out rather than looking in. Feminists are of course contesting this. Um, then you have also um, prevention. Now prevention was should have been a major thing in which you could have brought in demilitarization, could have brought in uh, something like, uh, like arms control and all that. But prevention really, frankly, had just got down to uh, preventing violence against women, uh, that is direct violence against women, making what uh, the global review 15 year, after 15 years, there was a global review piloted by Radhika Kumaraswamy in which they said very, very strongly, there's the militarization of the WPS agenda. And what you're doing is you're trying to make war safer for women. And I, I think this is one of the most devastating critiques, but um, it's become, rein, got reinforced rather than weakened. You had a whole series from 2015 onwards, you have a series of resolutions which, which actually co-joined UN women and the global terrorism um, apparatus in the UN system. And you brought in women, but you brought in the gender equality agenda as a part of countering violent terrorism. Uh, or violent extremism, the CVE, and the preventing of violent um, extremism. Uh, you see this in Afghanistan, you see actually this in Kashmir too, but let me just focus on Afghanistan. And here the problem was that you are incorporating gender equality in a military strategy and um, in military operations, delegitimizing gender equality, rendering women uh, distant from their communities, making them suspect and abandoning them, of course, when you quit. Um, it, uh, and of course, what it emphasizes is motherhood politics, which of course, again, reinforces women's passivity, women as victims. 
appealing to their sons not to get recruited or as early warning. But they, they, who are they warning? They are warning not, I mean, they should be warning their communities, but instead they are uh, supposed to warn command, military commanders. Now, so you can imagine this, the kind of dynamics they produce. So further reinforcement of the military um, militarization of WPS post the global review. These resolutions come in 2016, 2017, and so forth. Now, um, I'm just going to very quickly jump. There's no point my unpacking WPS. Let's look at Afghanistan. Afghanistan should be the test case of WPS. After all, what was Laura Bush, the president's wife, Sherry Blair, the prime minister of Britain's wife? What were all these uh, Hillary Clinton and all saying? We're going into Afghanistan to liberate the women, to end gender apartheid, uh, to save the women. Um, Gayatri Spivak, in her inimitable way, of course, puts it. These were white women or white men wanting to save brown women from brown men. Um, otherwise, you see, if you didn't have this moral patina, Otherwise, what you would have got was you would have got merely the um, sorry, just one second. I huh, um, you would you would have you see you needed a moral patina. Otherwise, what was it? The attack post 9/11 was a revenge attack by the Americans huh? to just reduce it to smithereens. Al Qaeda. Um, it was the invasion of Afghanistan. Was what? How do you justify it? Here is a non-state actor that has attacked you. Instead, you attack the state. You may not recognize the Taliban at that point, but it was still the government. You attacked a state. So how are you going to defend it? How are you going to morally legitimize it? How are you going to persuade people to sacrifice their lives by bringing in gender and bringing in saving women, protecting women? Um, but it's interesting, or, and you know, you, you follow the parallel trajectory of the development of the women, peace and security discourse and the Afghan uh, UN involvement and the international forces involvement in Afghanistan. You find ONAMA, which was the agreement for the UN's presence and involvement in Afghanistan, makes no mention of WPS. It doesn't mention UN Security Council Resolution 1325 till much, much later. In fact, the NATO forces don't mention um, anything to do with, gen, uh, with WPS till 2010. In fact, it was in 2010 that they, or rather 2008, nine, and in 2010, they actually brought in a gender advisor. So it's much later that actually there is an interweaving. And this is all the Security Council, huh? There is a very, very good study by Duncanson, Claire Duncanson and Vanessa Farr on the case of Afghanistan and the WPS uh, agenda. And their um, statement is, it did more harm than good in Afghanistan. Um, I'm, you know, not going to unpack it. I just want to read out to you some, or rather pull out some key findings on an official audit done by the US government itself, their special uh, investigative, uh, special investigative general who was, it's called the SIGAR report and the SIGAR has a gender equality report. There was something like, and we don't know the real figure, frankly, $1 billion is said to have been spent on um, promoting gender, supporting gender programs in by the US in Afghanistan during this 20 year period. But nobody knows how much. Why don't we know how much? Because as the, um, uh, the uh, SIGA report says, state and USAID have not consistently tracked or quantify the amount of money dispersed for projects which directly or indirectly support Afghan women, girls, or gender equality goals. Therefore, the full extent of US spending on gender programming is just not quantifiable. Um, there is a very spicy article by um, Rafia Zarkaria, a Pakistani col columnist on um, 
what a mess the US has done or white women have done in Afghanistan. Look at it if you feel like being titillated. But she does quote uh, that the, the, one of the biggest projects that the Americans had was something called Promote. And they spent $418 million on this. And the objective was to provide Afghan women with training, internship, and jobs. When the program was audited in 2016, it was impossible to trace where all the money had gone. And the influx, but the influx of ca uh, cash, as she says, it wasn't only a question of that it was wasted, but most important, that it distorted, it helped kill indigenous feminisms that might have worked to achieve more culturally appropriate goals. The aid economy meant that Afghan women activists abandoned their own program and rushed to implement American ones. Look, all of us who have been part of the NGO system know what distortions funding creates. And even the CIGA, that is the official audit, says that there were 24 US aided programs, gender related programs. And um, the, they, but they were based on assumptions that were ill suited to the Afghan context and the challenges that women and girls faced, which is of course why you now really have a situation of two Afghanistans. You have these women, feminists, I would say Afghan feminists, in the urban centers, and you have the entire rural population, which was not touched by, uh, or relatively home untouched by any of these gender programming goals and things. Um, and we keep asking ourselves, why is it that there was no support for in fact, the previous regime? because there was no organic root of the previous regimes, that the gains for women uh, during these 20 years were gains localized with just a very, very small minority of urban women. Uh, of course, for them, it's hugely important. And it is really a sad irony of entrapment that feminists, and Rava is the only one that held out on this, huh? that feminists, whether during the Soviet period, of occupation, or in fact, I would say the American period of occupation, they have supported the occupation because of gender equality goals. Rava, as I said, that is the Revolutionary Afghan Women's Association is the only one that opposed it. So you end up with feminists actually supporting imperial occupation. Um, but that's the way it goes. Now, I, I know I'm running out of time, and I just want to, um, just three things that I'm going to pull out. One is that one of the uh, pathways which went awry in Afghanistan in terms of gendered interventions was the absolute focus on militarization. You had militarization focus by, after all, you know, the US didn't go into Afghanistan to build the country. By default, it ended up doing a bit of that, but most of it is investment in the military sector. And even gendered programs, most of the, a lot of the investment was in security sector reform, which eventually got reduced to bringing in more women into the uniformed forces. Now, I want to just focus on this because this has repercussions for all of us or implications for all of us. Do you think that more women in the militaries, in the, in, the, um, in the uniformed forces makes for security or for less security? Is it desirable? Certainly it's desirable for gender parity and for gender equality, but is it desirable for security? You know, recently there was a news item two days ago that um, the bastion, masculine bastion of the National Defense Academy is gonna open its gates for women recruits to join the defense forces. Great, uh, that there has been an expansion, a horizontal expansion of women's combat roles. And there's this lovely photograph of women riflemen patrolling the LOC, that is from the Assam Rifles. But the question I want to ask is by folding more women or by folding in larger social groups 
larger areas of society into militarized culture, into the militarized institution, into expansion of military influences, military goals, military patterns of behavior into civilian life. Are we increasing security or are we increasing insecurity? Now, of course, here I would say it's important to add the caveat that high securitized situations bring out different responses depending on where women are located. Obviously, Kashmir women would find this an extremely insecure situation. So would I would say women in central India who are facing the Cobra force uh, against the Maoists. Um, I would say the Northeast as well. But, and yes, minority women would also regard uniformed uh, men, women as threatening. But do you think, and I leave this as a question, do you think that it makes for greater security? Is this something we should promote? Is this something we as feminists should promote? Then what is our understanding of security? If this is what we are promoting. For what is, you know, what is the military? The military is an institution that is at its core masculine. It's not just masculine. It is the production of violent masculinities. And you know, there's so much literature out there to show uh, how hostile the militaries have been to the women who have been joining them, not only in Afghanistan, but also of course in the US. Um, so it's also the propensity to use force to resolve conflict. I mean, you know, you're always told feminine values, negotiations, compromise, never put them in a hard security sector, they'll compromise, they'll betray you. Huh? They'll betray the national interest. So instead, what are we privileging? Because what the military does privilege is hardcore masculine values that, that have been socially constructed, just as socially constructed are feminine values of compromise, of subordination, of devaluing, of negotiation. So I would really, if we are talking about feminizing security or redefining security, then let us cons ask ourselves, is the expansion of the military into more areas of civilian life, into more social groups, the militarization of women, is that going to make for greater security or less security? Thank you. Rita, what a privilege it is to listen to you always. Um, you know, I think one should sit with a notebook, this breadth of things that you read, things that you cite, things that you remember and you talk about. Um, thank you so much for bringing all of that scholarship and experience to our forum. There will be questions, lots of questions. I can, uh, this is a group that I know and I know they always have uh, things to say. So I will turn that over, but before that, if you would allow and indulge, I want to do a little commercial. We have the third edition of our Peace and Gender Lunchtime Lecture Series coming up from September 20th to 24th, one o'clock to two o'clock, start and finish on time. We have five speakers and Mariam will put the poster up in a bit along with the registration link. There are some people who are veterans who've been to two series already catching the lectures. You don't have to come to all five of them. You can come to whichever ones you want and they are free. But we wanted to let you know that they're coming up and uh, we would like to see you all or several of you there as well. Um, so I see that there are already questions in the chat box. Um, the first one is from Telina. Telina, first of all, let me say it's lovely to see you here. Hi, I'm from Sri Lanka. Very inspiring to learn to listen to a South Asian feminist peace scholar and activist. I have read your work for a course I did on peace and conflict studies in India. Can you please share the name? of her books, that is your books. I'll do that, Delina. On another note, I wish all staff from US-funded peace building projects in Sri Lanka can 
read and listen to you. This is an amazingly enlightening perspective that we have to take into account in our everyday peace work, especially during the context of COVID and how the responses in most countries have been taken over by the military. So. Natasha Raghuvan, she sends me a note saying, thank you for organizing this. So fortunate to be able to attend a session like this one. You know, this is a small group. So I would say that if you have questions, we don't have to follow the protocol of the chat box. Um, you can actually just uh, raise your hand, unmute yourselves and jump in. But from Raja Pandian T, there is a question for you, Rita. What are your thoughts on women's column in the Kurdistan Independent Force? Okay, while I have met um, in large assemblies, women who have come from Kurdistan and are part of the Kurdistan movement, I am not too familiar with the Kurdistan column, which I would think is a militarized force. But I think the question one has to ask is, one, that it's important to recognize the very large presence of women or the mobilization of women in the um, by non-state actors uh, in the um, ethno-nationalist struggles. But he, having said this, and I think that is one of the problems because if you don't recognize them, then when it comes to demilitarization and peace processes, they tend to get sidelined or forgotten as we've seen in many what they call DDR processes. But and this, and since you may be, and you are likely to be far more familiar with the Kurdistan column, the question I would ask you is, is there a participation? Is there equal participation? Are there what Radhika Kumaraswamy called cogs in the wheel when she talked about the LTT women? I think a phrase that she probably has withdrawn a long time ago, but nonetheless, it stuck. Um, is there, possibility? Uh, are there any kind of uh, uh, gendered power revolution taking place within the Kurdish struggle to show in fact the in, in inclusion of the women's agenda in terms of what they're asking for? After all, the fight for equality, the fight for assertion must also include the fight for gender equality. Is it incorporated in the agenda? Regrettably, most um, of these uh, struggles, even where women are there in large numbers, and I'm thinking of 40% uh, of the, win, uh, of the uh, Maoist uh, in the People's War were women. Yet, when it came to demobilization and when it came to political participation post-conflict, somehow they just melted away. And one of the most curious things about Nepal, sorry to bring in a totally tangential situation is, you know, for that entire period, I didn't hear a voice of a Maoist woman. They were silenced. There were all kinds of voices from the uh, liberal side, uh, from the Nepali Congress, from the political parties, but from the Maoist women, I suppose their disciplinary protocol required silence. So when they got, in fact, shunted out, there was nobody to speak for them, including Hisala Yami, who had a ministerial position. But let me not digress too far onto this. I would say that, you know, frankly, one of the concerns is that in this dark agency of women, and I think it's important to recognize women's agency and their involvement in militarized violent politics, and the importance of, in fact, bringing in resistance politics in the WPS agenda even, which, and it's not there, is that we also need to demand, and we also need to ask, is there any scope for leadership? Is there any scope for um, reworking gender inequality, for reworking gender power relations? Or are they just cogs in the wheel? Are they like the comfort women? We have another question here in the chat box, also from Delina. 
Delina, would you actually like to unmute and ask your own question? I can read it out, but would you rather do that? And then we have Saumya. Yeah, sure, Swarna. Uh, I'm actually delighted to be a part of this uh, discussion today. Um, I want to ask from uh, Rita, um, I mean, um, there's, there is an increased violence in the global south. Um, and also I have noticed that there has been criticisms on the role of UN, particularly the UN Security Council, uh, that they can't be neutral anymore and they have to intervene. Um, I, th I have also noticed that this is in the discourse now more than ever as a feminist demand from countries like Sri Lanka, Myanmar and Afghanistan. But I may be wrong uh, because I'm like a different generation. <laughs> I'm from a different generation. So correct me uh, if I'm wrong. Um, so what I would like to know from you is what your thoughts on the UN Security Council failing to do justice to women in these conflict affected countries because of UN's neutrality. Sorry. You know, I don't know whether I would say it's the UN's neutrality. Um, if you look at the question of Myanmar, hmm? um, or in fact, in the end, we are going to see the same process in Afghanistan. The Security Council, because of the power plays that take place there, the veto power of the uh, five, you are not going to have, you are not going to get intervention. China will block it. And now in the case of Afghanistan, China, maybe even Russia will block it. So when you say the UN is neutral, I think state-centric systems, and in the end, the UN is a state-centric system. Um, it's a body of states. They are hamstrung. So I would not use the word neutral at all. They're not saying that they're neutral to the very obvious human rights violations, the very obvious egregious abuse that is going on in, um, um, in Myanmar or perhaps, and I'm, well, let, let's just park Afghanistan to the side for the moment, but they're not going to intervene because of state's balance of power politics. Um, it's not neutrality. So one is that. Second is, you know, the whole responsibility to protect discourse. It's now once again been wheeled back. It was in the forefront several, I think a decade ago or perhaps more. It's now back. But I think it's very important for us to problematize it. Imperialist interventions, interventions, militarist interventions do not necessarily make for greater security. And I think that is what I have been trying to argue that um, they come with this moral patina. But in the end, of course, you know, we do call for the UN. We call for the U uh, UN peacekeeping. But UN peacekeeping, and I think here you do need to bring in UN peacekeeping. You know, UN peacekeeping, the nomenclature is now changing. It's no longer called UN peacekeeping, it's called UN peace enforcement. And which is why there is a very high casualty rate, relatively speaking, of UN peacekeepers, because now they're asked. They're not asked to keep the peace. They're asked to keep the peace between two warring parties that are still warring and do not see the UN as a neutral force. They see the UN as, in fact, an affiliated force. So it's I think it's an extremely complicated issue. Um, I would request you to perhaps interrogate the use of the word neutral. I would um, ask you to problematize uh, encouraging doctrines like the responsibility to protect because you may not regret what you get. But yes, that does not mean that we will not call for the UN to act and to stop genocidal violence and to question. I mean, I think one of the most blunt instruments is sanctions. It's not at all desirable because you say, okay, you don't want military intervention, then do you want sanctions? No, because who do sanctions hurt most? They hurt the most vulnerable and they are the ones that we align with. So I, I would just say that this remains an extremely complicated issue. Uh, and while, of course, I want somebody to stop the military junta in Myanmar, 
but do I really want international intervention and what kind? And if the UN come, who will control the UN? After all, Afghanistan was controlled by Anama, but who controlled it? The US. It was a foreign occupation led by the US. And let's not, you know, beat about the bush. So, sorry, uh, frankly, one is still muddling one's way through this. Thank you so much for that. Samia? Uh, thank you, Swarna. Uh, hi, Rita. This was such an uh, enriching lecture. And I was back to being like a front bench student, uh, typing in furiously notes from your from whatever you were speaking. And despite a uh, high speed of typing, I still missed out a lot. Um, so I, I will have that conversation with you uh, later. And you mentioned so many works of so many feminists and i think those are all those need to be put as a list of a list for further reading for uh, those of us who are interested um the question i have it's not really a question it's more like um you know just thinking aloud um there was something you mentioned in the beginning uh, of your uh, lecture uh, when you were talking about Cynthia and Lo and, and all that. Um, you uh, talked about the relationship between um, peacetime violence and um, uh, militarized violence against, um, against women. And uh, I remember reading, I don't remember uh, the author, but I remember reading this um, from the Bosnian um, context, that um, you know, after the uh, uh, after the uh, genocide happened, and in which, of course, a lot of you know thousands of women were targeted for specific forms of violence. Uh, there was a study that said that domestic violence increased after that, um, and uh, a part of the explanation was that. Um, the men from the um, targeted community felt that their masculinity had been undermined because their women were, you know, uh, attacked, and uh, that aggression then was taken on in in a, in the form of domestic violence. So I'm uh, wondering whether you came across any other studies. And then in terms of the last question, you know, very provocative question that you. Uh, left us with as to whether, you know, militarization, you know, increasing the number of women within military uh, forces, although it may do a lot in terms of gender equality, gender parity, where does that leave us in terms of security? Um, I'm, I'm uh, uh, then wondering whether, you know, uh, I'm also wondering women being in the military or even the police or other security forces, what does that do in terms of their equation um, uh, within the family, um, you know, within the family as well? Is there going to be a change of equation there, which may be positive? At the same time, um, you know, if they are going to imbibe this very masculine, uh, you know, aggression, violence, dominance kind of a narrative once they join the security forces, that's not going to do much in terms of the security. So um, gender representation within women's representation within these forces and asking for demilitarization, are these contradictory um, uh, demands? And what is the tension and dilemma there? That's that I'm just thinking aloud. So I hope you'll be able to respond to some. Thank you so much, Samia. And I'm so glad that you are here. And I really deeply appreciate uh, your comments. Um, I want to just pick up on this whole continuum of violence and the studies that are available. You mentioned the Bosnian one. What was, uh, and more are emerging, but they're largely seen as anecdotal or uh, they're seen as um, very context specific. I want to refer to another one. And because you see, this is something that we're being challenged constantly. When we say there is, they're saying, okay, demonstrate the causal link. It's very difficult. You see, you can establish a correlation. 
And I think the Bostonian study, I don't, it's not, the person who wrote it is escaping me and it's somebody I know, which is why I'm upset, but that they were able to establish a correlation. They were not able to establish causal link. And there is a very definite difference. Um, but you said, is there, are, there, you know, are there other studies that evidence this? Kashmir, the Médecins Sans Frontières, they did a survey in 2011. I don't know if they did a subsequent survey in which they looked at sexual violence. And they found that in Kashmir, there was one of the most highest uh, of, you know, one in 11 person had actually undergone an experience of sexual violence. Um, now, whether it was within the family, whether it was within vis-a-vis uh, -vis the security forces, that was not disaggregated. What was that they had personally experienced? One in 11, that's a very, very high number. Now, are you going to then, you know, correlate? And there has been correlation. But you see, the problem is, unless we're able to establish the causal link, it'll always be thrown back at us. And, but there are studies, there are a lot of empirical studies that are taking place. Um, I, and if any of you in the audience know of, uh, or rather uh, on this webinar know of them, it would be really good to actually get that information. The other reason, thank you so much for, in fact, uh, teasing out more complexities of the problem uh, of women joining the militaries. And frankly, the women's groups are totally divided on this. Um, you know, it's much easier to say that we have some understanding that, you know, the increasing number of women in the militaries, and in some places you're getting, um, you know, 20%, 30%, which is pretty large, is not making for any kind of an institutional change in their culture. That question is one that is being asked. That's a question that is being studied. But the question you asked, which is those women who joined the militaries, are, is there actually any, does women's empowerment uh, or does the ex, ex, uh, gender parity, gender equality in the military, in, because of their presence in the militaries, actually translate into the reworking of gender relations within the family. Frankly, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure there are there is work on this. I don't know, but it's a very valid question. Um, I would have my doubts because have we seen that earning... I've always asked myself this, women in Kerala are earning. But has it made for really a redistribution of gender power within their intimate family? It looks as if it hasn't. But, you know, this is a very different, uh, made aggressive culture of the military. What, how do they, do they bring it to the home? How can they not bring it to the home? How can their familiarity with weapons not actually make for greater insecurities in the home? Is it just because they're women that it will then be totally different? I don't know. I think these are fascinating questions to ask. We have another 13 minutes for questions or discussion. Uh, if anybody has I was actually thinking of your answer to Samya on women earning and they but women earn in other areas and that ha alone hasn't made a difference to family relationships. Mm -hmm. I think that the, the key difference would be in the ability of the woman to wield um, violent weapons, to be able to hit back perhaps the authority that she gets in a uniform. I think that it would be interesting to see if there are studies of women police because they are much more prevalent and yeah. widespread. And then we could kind of, uh, for starters, extrapolate from that to see, but that's a really interesting um, dimension. Yeah. You know? 
sometimes people do say that with panchayats, yes, yes, the relationships have changed, but there isn't enough work systematically done to be able to generalize on any of these things. You know, if there is a moment, I want to just do some um, propaganda. Um, there is a, a, a podcast that Women's Regional Network has hosted with um, the UN Special Rapporteur on um, uh, balancing fundamental freedoms and countering terrorism. Uh, she's a, um, a professor of law at Belfast University, Funuala Niaulem, Irish. Um, and um, she takes on the Women, Peace and Security uh, group of resolutions. And she says, this is a moment of reckoning. It's a moment of reckoning, not only for states, but for all of us, us women networks, women collectives who have invested so much energy and uh, belief, faith in the 1325 agenda that she actually asked for women to boycott mm -hmm. the Security Council meetings, which are now going to happen on women, peace and security. And I think in a couple of weeks or so, there is the UN Security Council is going to take on the women, peace and security agenda because she says, you failed us, WPS dropped dead when you dropped women from, or you dropped even the possibility of women from the negotiations, the US Taliban negotiations. There is not a word of gender of women's rights in the agreement that the US negotiated with the Taliban. It was not considered relevant. So she says, what is the value of this resolution, of this discourse, of this women, peace and security agenda, if when it really matters, we drop it. Trying to find the podcast link to place in the chat. Just found it. I think this is the correct one. Um, but this is a whole series of podcasts that WRN is organizing, and I, you know, urge you to check them out. Uh, Samya and Priyanka, since you are both here, do you also want to promote the the upcoming theater, interactive theater? Please. Yes, yes, of course. Thank you for the platform, Swarna. Uh, hi, Rita. I'm hi. sorry, I'm a little late because I had another official meeting going on, but I heard snippets and it was fantastic. So lovely to hear you, as always. Um, Soumya and I here on behalf of WRN India are very happy to let everyone know that we are hosting a fabulous event this month, and which is uh, an interactive play. It's a, by a theatre group, El Poapio Theatre Group, where they're going to be talking about and presenting a play about the intersectionality of gender and COVID. And uh, we have put up the poster and we have shared it. There is a registration link. There are four shows that are happening this month. We've kept it a little late in the evening. It starts at 8 p.m. Indian Standard Time. And uh, you just need to register on the link and then we will give you, send you the tickets, the online tickets to access the shows because we want to make sure that all the four shows have an even distribution of the audience. But we've seen a preview and uh, it looks very exciting. So we would love you and really encourage all of you to join us for this show. Soumya, would you like to add something? No, I'm... Uh... I'm just trying to uh, get the poster and the link so that uh, we can paste it here in the chat box so that, you know, uh, everyone can have it. So I'm just trying to get that uh, uh, done. But um, other than that, There's I think... There's a problem uh, with attachments in the chat. Mm -hmm. So if you can just put, the, put a link to the poster or the event, okay. that would be good. Okay, fine. Yeah. We can just paste the registration link also, Samia. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to do that. Yeah. But uh, if you don't mind, can I also just uh, ask a question to Rita? It's, please, please do. Following up from uh, what you were particularly speaking, but you know, ever since uh, 
I've had the opportunity to, uh, I caught the part where you were speaking about Myanmar. And I've had the opportunity, good or bad, for the last five years to have, uh, of course, prep prior to the coup, to uh, be inside Myanmar, uh, inside many regions, uh, including a small part of the Rakhine state also and Yangon, uh, as a consultant with the Forum of Federations, Canada, because we do uh, capacity building workshops you know, on federalism invited by the government, right? With women's groups, women organizations, also women parliamentarians. And I've done that in three occasions. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously right now everything is cut off and this is a safe space where I can just uh, share also that we have managed to uh, evacuate our entire team from there. And they are now being hosted by Chiang Mai University and the entire operations are happening out of Thailand. But, uh, we see a kind of, you know, um, comfort coming in with the current uh, military disposition inside Myanmar and the groups that are there, especially also the women's groups and the, all the NGOs, because they feel that that's the only way they have to survive, right? Mm -hmm. They have to accept it and they have to move on. And while we sitting outside, uh, can be you know critical about it the fact is for the people inside Myanmar this is the new normal for them they have been through this and uh, they know they just have to take the right boxes with the you know new government which is even saying that they're going to ask women's groups to come forward and give their uh, suggestions as to how the uh, constitution can be changed and how the new government can change and of course this is all the hogwash with any typical military you know group in power does and has always done that but i find that very disturbing you know when um, we kind of normalize it and we think that this is how we must carry on right because myanmar's history is such that uh, whatever the West has done, whether sadly, whether it's been sanctions or as you've been done, you've been doing whatever, it's not worked. It's not worked. When you're inside Myanmar, you know that they are in their own bubble and they just carry on, irrespective of what happens outside. Like, you know, you can't even mention the R word when you are inside Myanmar. We talk about them as the other, whereas I myself in India have done work with the Rohingya refugees, you know, but all international people who are inside Myanmar, the entire NGO group, the, you know, the kind of the consulate groups, we don't talk about it because obviously for due reason. How does one, and a human rights person, you know, an academic, how do we tread this, you know, this fine line and how do we, like, I just, with your experience, you know, and your seniority, I would love some advice, <laughs> you know, it's uh, so for us. <laughs> yeah. I, I want to just divide it into two, okay? Um, one is, I think it's important for us to recognize that women are political. Huh? I have found even the most um, grassroots of women very, very political. And one of the problems of the, frankly, WPS agenda has been the depoliticization of women, making, you know, flattening them out, making them all for peace, making them all for, uh, that's not what they are. I mean, as you said, you found really a complexity of shades and responses um, because after all, survival is important survival resilience is hugely important. Would they trust you to even talk to you? What are they doing on the side? And many of them are doing amazing things. We saw that with the Afghan women. So we don't really know. I think what is, what is just very, very important is to recognize that these are not, uh, women are not pre-political subjects. We are political, even all these women. I mean, you know, when you ask them, you go, for election and as a journalist i've done this so often who are you going to vote for of course they'll lie to you of course they'll say Hame kuch nahi pata. Um, but they do know and i think one is not to underemphasize them but the second question which is you know um this whole thing about if you go there to work there in the ngo sector or as a human rights activist or uh, as a journalist um what are the red lines that you want to you are you can cross and you can't cross how much do you want to betray your own agenda 
Yeah. Because you see, after all, you are doing that by compromising, by, uh, of course, one is to respect that resilience is desperate resilience, that these are survival techniques. I mean, you know, child's marriage is not what you want, uh, what is desirable. But yes, you're going to, I mean, if that's what renders things more, what you think renders things more secure. But I think, frankly, a lot of people get out. And in the end, beyond the point, you know, uh, you can't, you can't legitimize. Then you're becoming like, then you're no different. Yeah, yeah, we cannot, we cannot, absolutely. And, but these are very tricky questions because good people are there, I don't want to judge them. I know they're providing humanitarian assistance. And if the provision of humanitarian assistance or capacity building requires discretion, that's different. But if it requires actually condoning and legitimizing, that's where you draw the line. At least that's... Yes, yes, of course, of course. Thank you so much, Rita. Aswana, if you don't mind, can I plug something else here on the forum? Just want to let everybody know that the Global South Women's Forum meet uh, it's happening 2021 next week. It's a five day conference. And from India, from my university, we have a session that we are hosting. We've been given a two hour slot on Wednesday, where we are taking a session on uh, women marginalization and climate change narratives from the global south. It's going, if you register for the workshop, the international workshop, and if you can please come and attend our session, because we're going to have an interactive uh, two hour session with uh, myself, my uh, uh, PhD scholars, musicians, artists, poems, and the paintings and talking about women, environmental change and marginalization in those two hours. So this is the Global South Women's Forum 2021, and uh, it's starting next week. And from India, we have our session on the 15th September. So I'll just see if the link is available and I'll just share that here too. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Priyanka. Thank you everybody for coming. I knew this was going to be a fantastic session and so it has been. Thank you so much, Rita. Uh, I know that we are all overcommitted and 9-11, I was very lucky to, I think, book you before anyone else did. So keep coming. Uh, you know, this is also a platform that all of you own. This is not just something that we do in the corner and Chennai. Anybody wants to put something out, do something, you know, we're here. So I really hope that I will see many of you again. Many of you, like Natasha, come regularly. And so it's lovely to see Kanal Marie. We're so happy to have you here all the time. It sort of makes us feel like, okay, we're still doing the right thing. So we hope to see others often as well. And some of you, I think, maybe at the Peace and Gender Lecture Series. Until next month, second Saturday morning, 10.30 to 12. October, we have a speaker, um, Divya Kannan from Shivnadar University, um, speaking on her research, which is also, which is around, which is a completely different topic, but yet exactly the same. It's on inequality and social justice and change. And a little bit of it will be, I think, COVID related, of course. So